Now it's time to have a conversation. Um, and uh, we'll continue the conversation. We have a couple mics here in the audience. Um, and if you make a single file line, I promise we'll speak until 1030 comes up. Um, so one there and, and I think one over here uh, somewhere. Okay, yeah, perfect. Um, so any questions for anyone on the panel? Don't rush all at the same time. Uh, oh, Miss Miss S, can I see your court list? I want to know how we can help you young people. I turned 84 this week, and I'm and I'm not leaving. So I I would like to know if you can articulate that how we can help you. The rest of us are dug in, but I want you lifted way up. So. Can you answer that? Well, I'm 17, and <laughs> <laughs> I'm not leaving either. Uh, <laughs> I think the best way that adults can help is that, honestly, I think sometimes it's that they need to take a step back. O often adults, um, <laughs> adults do like to lead charges. They're always the ones in front of the room, and that's great. Good for them. But <laughs> I think that, uh, I, I don't know, children or young adults, as we prefer to be called. Uh, <laughs> I think often we're the ones that know best about what is good for our future. Adults have experience. Adults know a lot about the world. But as young people, we, we know what we're doing. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Perfect. Dave Court. Hi, thank, thank you. Is that on? Yep. It's coming. Yeah, I'm Dave Court, San Drano Valley Community Center, and uh, it was just an incredible panel. About in the late 90s, there was this program called Tools for Tolerance that mostly it went through MCOE. But almost every teacher in Moran and a lot of us in nonprofits got to go down and it was all paid for to uh, the Wiesenthal Museum in uh, Los Angeles. And um, I know for me, it was the most powerful thing I ever experienced. It was two days, and uh, I went with 33 staff members of <clears throat> the Lagunitas School District, and everybody at our community center went too. And, and I know that's stayed for me. It's almost 20 years now. But I know right now there's this whole generation of teachers, nonprofit leaders, government people that didn't get to experience that. And, and I think it means time for an opportunity for something really powerful like that again. And um, so I don't know if there's, for those of you up here, some models that you've seen. Um, are there some opportunities in the county for us to do something that, I mean, I don't know the number, but it was hundreds and hundreds of people from Marin went to that. So I think it's time for something like that again. And I don't know if Steve has any ideas or um, something the foundation get, get behind. Um, but I, I think we really need something like that. Julie, are you aware of any convenings that uh, might be appropriate for folks wanting to figure this subject out? Yeah, um, uh, sort of the training and increasing understanding is something that we do a lot of. Um, and we use a train the trainer model because what happens sometimes if you just go to something, I mean, I, I, it's good anytime you're increasing knowledge and understanding, really um, that's a positive thing. But what would, when we're focused on changing organizational policy and practice, changing organizational culture, it's really important to build the skills and expertise of people within the organization. So a lot of times we will use a train the trainer model where we've got a couple of different types of curriculums that we use. And so it helps so that it's not just someone coming from the outside or you going to something special, but that you're really building the capacity of your own organization, not only to increase understanding, but to also change policy and practice. So yeah, and would be happy to share more information on that with anyone who's interested. And maybe we can get it up on the first five website? 
some some of these links. Thank you. When Michelle gets back. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Hey, Shelly. Hi. Again, I want to thank you so much for this event, and um, I hope it's the first of many. Um, I'm the executive director of Marin Space, and we're an organization that fosters and works to support collaborative efforts around the county. And our, our uh, history really comes from place-based efforts and co-location centers and real estate in the service of the public good. And what I wanted to ask you about was uh, talking about the role, especially around policies and practices and principles with respect to the role of real estate. Uh, it could be housing and equity. It could be the real estate that government owns in terms of our school systems own a lot of property um, and the role that government plays in zoning and real estate regulations and how that plays into the places, kind of a place based perspective on equity and any insights that you have that you could share with us about how we can make change because that's a real systemic institutional uh, system that I think has a lot of impact on yeah. this issue. Yeah. Uh, two things I would say, Steve already talked about the history of redlining, um, that we need to be clear that sort of the histories, neighborhoods, communities that we have now, they're not, they were intentionally segregated through policy and practice. And so we're living with that legacy, that if we actually want to see uh, integrated mixed income neighborhoods, then we need to do things like think about where affordable housing is located in different, different communities. So that's one thing. And the other thing that I would say is around a, from a fair housing perspective, did I hit a raw nerve there? <laughs> <laughs> we're, 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 we're grappling with that issue now. <laughs> Good. You should grapple with it because it's important. You know, sometimes the way um, sort of who lives where, it, you know, it has to do with how schools are funded. It's, you know, like it's a million and one different things. And so I'm really happy to hear that you're grappling with it. But the other thing I'd say is around fair housing. Um, they, you know, talked about implicit versus explicit bias. Used to be that you'd see explicit bias. Um, you know, people were prevented, signs in the windows saying who could live where. Well, the truth is, is that we still have bias um, when City of Seattle did fair housing testing based on race, um, the differential treatment, 69% of the time, 69% of the time there's a difference in the way that a white person and an African American person is treated. Then we also did it on ethnicity and the numbers there were a little bit lower, but I mean really not any, it just marginally lower. And so what that means is that differences in prices, you know, hundreds of dollars difference in prices based on your race. Um, difference in amenities, um, the availability of units, that all that stuff is, you know, it's about the accessibility of housing. And so sort of thinking about the reality that we think we've got fair housing now, but when you actually test for it, we don't. And so I think the um, work to be done around fair housing um, need to think about it from an uh, implicit per bias perspective. In Seattle, after we did that testing, we actually worked with landlords to do um, education and policy change so we would minimize or reduce, hopefully eventually eliminate um, those biases that play out. Thank you. Steve, did you want to? You know, I, I, I think the, the only thing that I would add for each of us in the room here, um, I brought up the issue about the conversation around community character or safe communities. We each have a responsibility when our friends and our neighbors or even those who are writing guest columns on a regular basis in our local newspapers <laughs> uh, try to diminish the implicit bias or even the uh, e explicit racism mm -hmm. that lies just beneath the surface, uh, that we speak up about that. That we take it up one-on-one -on -one with our neighbors, our friends, and people, that we have the courage to call it for what it is. And I, I want to just take a moment. There's a fellow who's not in the room with us today, but his name's John Young. And John Young took the Grassroots Leadership Network, and he made a point about the explicit racism in our county. And he was heavily attacked. So gird up for the conversation, but have it. Thank you. Yes. Supervisor with Marin County Health and Human Services, and um, I got invited to this event by chance because I met with one of the 
women who work at the Marin San Francisco Food Bank. Mm -hmm. And I found it interesting, and so I wanted to come and see, and I've been really pleased with what's been presented so far. But the question I have is for Supervisor Kenzie, is there um, any plans in the works to make sure that within Health and Human Services we have these kind of discussions and conversations in order to make sure we branch out and show this kind of um, advancement and equality to the community? Because I feel like our clients, yeah, I, know. I feel like our clients may have myths and misconceptions about the way that we, um, you know, uh, do our work or the way we deal with them. And uh, I found that you know to be some of the interesting topics and conversations that are also taboo and we don't want to talk about. So um, I just wanted to ask. Thank that you. Question. Thanks for asking that question. It, it would be easiest for me to just divert attention to the next speaker, uh, <laughs> who is the Director of Health and Human Services, and who is, in fact, leading a strategic planning process under a framework of equity uh, for the entire department. So I have a great confidence that that issue will be addressed. I also think that through our mental health programs, there's a really strong leadership there, Zelar Lagleva and others who are working to create cultural competency with the community that you serve. Um, and I think our affinity groups are intended to allow you to also bring forward the issues that you feel within your own cultural identity that need to be addressed. So uh, perhaps, uh, Dr. Colfax will add some thoughts about that, but I think that uh, he truly has the, the tools that we've given your department to address that. Senator Colfax. Yeah. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Supervisor, and thank you for the question. I think it's really important. And, and I've been in HHS for the, as the director for about a year now, and um, one of the key things as we think about the health and wellness of Marin County through the lens of equity, which is where we're going, um, all of our work will be done through an equity lens uh, moving forward. We know that there's a 17-year life expectancy difference um, depending on your zip code. So in Marin County, your zip code matters a lot more about how long you live than your genetic code. And we are moving forward with a plan that's aligned with the county's five-year business plan to really bring equity forward in a data-driven way and to have the hard conversations that I think Supervisor Kinsey is talking about. I mean, we can gloss over this. We can sort of do the, you know, internet training and then everybody feels better because you've checked something off the list. But if you actually look at communities like King County and other places where they really turn the curve, this takes a lot of hard work and it takes a lot of institutional support and it takes a lot of leadership. And it takes leadership from all levels of the organization organization, right? So to meet the needs of the folks that we serve, to meet the needs of the county through the equity piece, we're going to be engaging in the strategic planning process and really bringing forward the resources and the investments and also the hard conversations to change this. You know, there, there's a certain amount of the institutional forces that have developed these inequities are very hard to shift without really making some some changes and if we keep doing things the same way we've been doing them we're not going to change them so i really welcome your leadership because we th we know from hhs it's going to take people across the organization to shift and the folks in the community are going to join in that conversation and we'll be moving forward in the next few years to really make a difference here so thank you for the question and you're on the spot, so <laughs> I'll be looking back with you and others. Um, so, and I also just want to say, as part of our equity work, one of the pilots that the pilot, Steve mentioned about the pilots, and Dr. Matt Willis, who's here, is working around the childhood obesity pilot through the lens of equity. 40% of the cardiovascular disease differences in, in, that we see in the African-American community compared to the rest of the communities is due to obesity. And so we're starting, working with the schools, a childhood obesity program that's, that's starting down you know, early on in life because we know that if we can shift eating habits and exercise habits early in life in communities, we won't see those equities in cardiovascular disease moving forward. So that's just a really tangible example. We can talk about these theories and these huge, you know, these huge um, uh, structural issues, but I think we really got to get real down to the program level to make a difference. And that's one of the pilots that's being supported by the board. So I do have a question. Um, <laughs> And it's actually a different, it's, it's, I wanted to ask the youth panel, um, one of the biggest ways to affect change in our culture is at the ballot box. And one of, an initiative in San Francisco that's going on the ballot um, is to have, to allow 16 and 17 year olds to vote in local elections. And I just wanted um, one or all of you to speculate and, and ask if that's a conversation any of your groups have been having. 
Well, it's not a conversation that we've been having in our groups at this moment. It's definitely something that we should be considering. Um, one of the, uh, the former facilitator of the Marin County Youth Commission actually moved to the San Francisco Youth Commission, and on her first day, they were discussing that very issue. So I think it's something very pertinent to the youth, especially because it's something that we're going to either be wanting or be angry about having in the future. Because like, <laughs> yeah. So, um, uh, Ball, do you have anything else, some insight? I just think that's awesome. That would be so cool <laughs> if I could vote. Um, I know right now I'm taking a government class and it's kind of dumb because I'm learning about <laughs> government and they're saying you should participate and then they, gave us, they give us no way to participate in our local government. So I'd be on board. Yeah. <laughs> any, any thoughts, Jose, about that? Um, well, Matter of fact is that I'm turning 18 this June, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's the best way to move forward. Yeah, either way, I'm sure. all for it. <laughs> Julie. Yeah, I wanted to, I'm not a youth, um, but, <laughs> um, but I support them voting as young as possible. 16 sounds good. Um, I, I wanted to say something about the obesity program because how we talk about race really matters. And sometimes the way that we frame things, that, that the way we talk about them, lead us to one solution versus another. And so when you think about something from, in a, a, well, obesity is a disproportionality. If we're just talking about obesity without thinking about institutions institutional and structural drivers of it, it all gets centered on poor choices. You know, it's like, why are people not eating healthy, healthy food? Why are they not exercising? And what we really, from a leverage perspective, looking at why that is. Are there food deserts? Are there safe routes for kids to walk to school? Are there parks? That we know that those institutional and structural drivers are what create obesity inequities. And so, you know, it's always love. So to, I'm, I'm, I'm worked in human services for um, a lot of years too. And so I always love health and human services programs, but I think sometimes those of us in the field of health and human services, it's too easy to look at the program piece and it's where within um, the county and within the city, thinking about the policies that are creating inequities. Hi, this question is for Superintendent, um, Supervisor, excuse me, Steve. Um, my name is Ruthie Amen. I'm from the Novato Youth Center. I'm the Child Development Program Manager. And um, when you mentioned the Strong Start initiative, um, it uh, brought me to a question for you. Um, we serve children from 12 months to 14 years of age, and we are committed to quality preschool. But with quality preschool means that we need to also have uh, lots of training for our, our teachers as well in education. So the question to you is, is there conversation about pay, better pay for our teachers? There should be, mm. uh, and there has been, and you can only do so many things with a certain limited set of resources. Uh, I was privileged to be a part of the program, the county, uh, First Five, and the Community Foundation supported the CARES <coughs> program a number of years ago, which really did emphasize increasing the compensation and also the training and the skill levels of the workforce. Um, I've advocated for this measure having some provision for that, um, I don't believe that it currently does, um, but I do believe that, that the recognition within the measure, within Strong Starts, is that we have to have quality to be able to be successful. And so I think it's an unfinished job that we all have to work on. Well, one of the things that we're finding is that there is a deficit in the um, pool of teachers. And what's keeping us from hiring quality teachers is the fact that we are not able to compensate them for all of the work that they're doing. So this is a bigger conversation that we have to have. And if, you know, if we're talking, if politicians are talking about raising minimum wage to, um, a, to living wage, and if that's going to be at $15 an hour, then we need to talk seriously about what we're going to do for our teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Maricruz Saldana, and um, I'm also a child care teacher. 
And so I just wanted to see if there was any efforts on supporting the Legislative Women's Caucus to put $8 million into the child development system. Um, because as I'm hearing about Strong Start, but I don't, I'm not hearing about this, the support for this legislation, or is if there is. You, you know, we as a county have been very supportive of legislation at the state level, and I think that uh, th this is an attempt to get into the budget of the state budget. I believe it's $800 million uh, statewide uh, to reinforce this. Um, this is also where one of the really important tenets of uh, the First Five Commission is advocacy and have been actively involved with the First Fives around the state in pushing forward these kinds of initiatives. Um, so yes, we're on board. It does require action at both the legislative and the gubernatorial level for the budget. So it just, I, I hope that, you know, maybe getting the word out will help also other people become aware of what's going on too because I feel like there's a lack of information, of sharing of, the, of this information and I feel like we would need support of a whole community to have these efforts be supported. So. Thank you, yes we do and you know we do have a child care council in our county, we also have a child care commission and they've been reporting to our board and they've brought these concerns to our attention and as the last speaker mentioned, if, if the statewide uh, minimum wage goes to $15 an hour but the reimbursement rate for child care centers doesn't go up, we haven't really solved anything in that area. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kay, and I work with Marin Advocates for Children. But I'm here to kind of ask a different question. I'm a retired government employee that worked for 30 years in human resources. And Ferguson was talked about today, and I applaud the county for what they're doing in terms of trying to work with implicit bias in the hiring practices. But one of the things through that I learned through my career is what are the structures and policies that public service agencies have about who they can hire and who they can't hire, and how does post standards affect the ability to hire people of color who might come against law enforcement issues more frequently in their youth before they're reaching out for a job. And I just kind of want to open that discussion up. It's not something that can be solved here, but to government officials, Marin's taking a huge step that other counties and communities in the North Bay, I just don't see it happening. So I applaud you. Thank you. I, I, I'll just put a postscript to that. We haven't, we haven't actually looked at the post uh, standards necessarily, but we have recognized that the kind of testing that we do uh, to bring people into employment here may have and probably does have biases built into that. And so we have changed the way in which we're doing our competency testing uh, for employment at the county. What's, what's POST, Steve? POST is uh, police officer training. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's associated with public safety officers and you have to get certified in order to be hired by a police and sheriff organizations. So POST is a certification program of competency in law enforcement. Uh, my name is Kerry Pearson. I'm a Mill Valley um, resident and I want to thank are you in particular, Steve and Jonathan, and the, the committees that have been working on behalf of equity? I have a question that's going to come to you, uh, uh, Julie. And it has to do you, are you reference uh, frequently your, your use of data and in determining what sounds to me more like a uh, effort at uh, reducing or eliminating inequity? that we're pretty far from equity, so we're trying to eliminate the barriers to, to inequity. And so I'm, I'm imagining going forward decades when we've eliminated inequity, but we still have the uh, socioeconomic dis disparities that exist. And so I guess this is, this is for you, but has uh, Seattle or the Washington area looked at ways to e address the other economic and educational disparities at the point where we begin to uh, approach. Um, yeah, ex. yeah. No, thank you. And to your point, class and race in the United States are really inextricably intertwined. 
that we have a huge income inequality problem in the United States. And so, you know, conversations around increasing the minimum wage, you know, that's one strategy and it's really insufficient in my mind. I mean, not to say Seattle passed $15 an hour minimum wage, support it. And in Seattle, $15 an hour is not a, not a living wage. And so I think at a really sort of foundational level, we need to have a conversation around income inequality in the United States. We know that race also holds class in place. That, and part of the way in which we're uncomfortable talking about race means that class inequities continue to get perpetuated. When you hold income constant, there are still racial inequities. So I think that for us to have a conversation that recognizes the complexity, you know, people always want to pull them apart. You can't pull them apart because they're so inextric inextricably intertwined. Great. So check it out. We have about uh, 10 minutes, and um, I want to try to do a little bit of rapid fire um, over the next seven minutes, and then we'll have a three-minute close. Um, so if you can uh, uh, ask the questions as quickly as possible, and then we'll get uh, quick responses from the, uh, from the panelists. Um, so, uh, Vin? Okay, I promise I'm going to make it short. <laughs> uh, as I come to the event like that, I hate to talk up to Carrie. You're going to bring all the points up already. Mm -hmm. Actually, I don't have no uh, question for you, but I have a comment. And uh, I applaud the uh, uh, first fire of the initiative today. And anytime you talk about equity issue in Marine County, it seems like you open a can of worm. There's so many things to talk about. And I also want to applaud the uh, leadership of the board. Uh, last Wednesday, I attend an uh, event for the uh, Asian American Public Employee event that I met a gentleman who is the chief executive uh, director of the court system in Marine County. He happened to be a person of color. And also another person heading the uh, new uh, uh, he, he, no, no, human resource director, the department is also a person of color. That's the first time in my life, I mean, not in my life, in my 20 plus uh, year in the Marine County, that's all that happened. So I mean, I think you, you do make some progress. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And my other suggestion is, uh, we talk about the public sector equity issue. We also need to talk about the non-public mm -hmm. equity issue as well. As uh, you know, in Marine County, a 2,000 plus non-profit uh, service, the needy people in the Marine County, how many of them are actually uh, executive, executive board director of person of color, leading the non-profit? I'm not asking for promotion. I just want to yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, my name is Magali Limeta. I'm a community member, um, but my question was for Supervisor Kinsey. How can we have working families be part of the political process? Sometimes meetings take place during the day and families are working 12 to 14 hours to ensure that they have food on the table. So what can we do as a community to ensure that we're, we communicate with the um, Latino, African American community that they can and have a voice in the political process? Thank you. Uh, you know, meetings, uh, especially the meetings of the Board of Supervisors, really the end game, uh, usually, most of the decisions have been made uh, leading up to it. And so uh, I think that uh, participating through your community organizations, uh, the leadership training programs that uh, various groups like Grassroots Leadership Network and the Welcome Center have provided, that give you the skill sets to how to understand even when and where to be in government. Um, I take your point uh, uh, as to the daytime versus the evening meetings, and we have tried and could try again uh, to see if we can have more engagement through evening meetings. So it's something I'll take back to our board. Thank you so much. Jim. Good morning. So I'm Jim Hogeboom. I'm the superintendent of Nevada Unified and want to say I'm super proud of Bilal and Jose, you guys. <laughs> so incredibly articulate, I can't believe it, so I wish you'd be in Nevada, but that's okay. <laughs> uh, I'd like to point out one more person who I met today, Marjorie Dugadilla, worked for the first five, and last I saw her at Hill Middle School, congratulations. <laughs> 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 
So my question is, how do we empower more students like you guys to have a voice in our system, not only in schools, but you talked a little bit about, hey, get out of the way, we know what we're doing, and which, I, I, which I applaud. So how do we do more of that? Because not enough students, I think, are actively involved, not only in education, but other ways to really speak out to change the way we organize things. So how do we get more of our students to be like you guys? <laughs> Who wants to take that? <laughs> go, go for it. You need a platform to start something or else it's really difficult to get anything done. And when you're a kid and you're already working on education, trying to do something to change your community might seem like a secondary purpose because you're, trying, you're committed to trying, have, trying to have a better future for yourself. Sometimes it's difficult to think of a better future for everyone else. And so that's put on like a back burner kind of thing. But if you give students, a they give, you give them facilities to do it. You teach them how to facilitate meetings. You teach them like basics of being leaders, the basics of the issues that we're facing. You teach them to understand the issues they're facing, then they become more passionate about the issues. They can rec recognize them in everyday situations, see how pertinent they are to their success, and then they become more passionate. And so you need a platform for them to become leaders in order for, that makes that makes it a lot easier for that to happen so they don't have to start a grassroots grassroots initiative by themselves. Great. Great. Does she does she speak for you all? I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> Beth. Hi, my name is Avalon. Um, I'm a first generation college graduate, so I work for ten thousand degrees as a fellow. Um, all of the fellows are first generation college grads. They're all young adults, so I really appreciate the call out from the law <laughs> earlier, that was perfect. Um, not only are we all first gen, but we're all from low income communities, and for the most part, although I don't represent this, they're all also people of color. So um, we have our fellow program, which is like a peer to peer model, and then we also have a high school leadership program for students. And so my question is, as far as a through G courses or getting students to be aware of how they can get to college and what they need to do. This is for the students, not how can we support you, because we already, I feel like we've, we've talked about that a lot, but where do you need to be in the community so that you can reach those students? Let me have uh, Bilal take that one on. So from our data that we've collected from our surveys and our study, we found that um, there's a lot of different sources that people learn about the uh, A to G requirements from. Uh, it can be your parents, it can be your counselors, it can be your, uh, you know, your other friends. And unfortunately, these sources are not always equally distributed throughout the community. Um, we found that often in, you know, counseling centers, the, the A to G requirements, which, you know, should be very, very apparent because, uh, you know, they're so extremely important to a student's, you know, uh, educational goals, they're not always openly accessible to everyone, especially in different languages. And that's probably one of the huge reasons why English language learners are not achieving these A2G requirements as much as other groups, because uh, they just don't know about it. Um, and on top of that, uh, I think one of the big advances that we've had at San Marin is that uh, these English language uh, classes are not um, they're not UC approved, so they don't, mm. they aren't being used to fulfill these A to G requirements. And at San Marin, what we've had is that now these, you know, they call them sheltered classes, I don't know if that's the perfect term for it, but uh, these classes that are catered more towards English language learners are now UC approved and they do help fulfill these A to G requirements. And I think that's a huge step forward. That's great. And if we could have more like that, that would be great. <laughs> so quick follow-up question. Um, when do you think students in your, in your data, if you've talked about this, when do you think these students need to know? Okay, when in their... So as early as possible. We're actually handing out our surveys to middle school students because as early as possible is always the best. Because, you know, when you're a junior, when you're a senior and you find out that there's all these classes that I need to take, it's way too late. And there's just no way to come back from it. So middle school, it's perfect. <laughs> great, great. All right, so folks, we are unfortunately at our time. <laughs> um, we are at our time. But, but let, me, let me say this, let me say this. This is a, the start of a discussion. This is not the, the end. Uh, we never anticipated that we could cover all of the ground in, in two hours. 
Um, but this is the start and we have to continue this discussion and we have to figure out a format as a county uh, for having these discussions um, across the entire entire county. And so um, let's, let's be thinking about that collectively and let's think about resources at uh, institutions, the county, Marine Community Foundation, school districts, um, and, and think about key folks within those organizations that could facilitate uh, more of this discussion. It's, it's so important uh, that, we, that we do it. I wanna give our panel, um, I, I, gotta, I gotta go to Suzanne, all right? And, uh, otherwise, she's gonna she, take care of me after, so. 81 years, 80 years old, I've been standing up. I just wanna say thank you to everybody for, for Amy, first of all, for calling this together and the importance of, of continuing these conversations in our communities. I want to thank all of the panelists. In terms of providing a platform, there's a couple of things I want to mention. Number one, we have in the San Geronimo Valley an upcoming event on May 25th called Kids, Drugs, and Alcohol 2015 Tools and Strategies. I want to invite you, Ruby, to please come and these two young men to join us. It's in the evening, it's at 6.30, and we really want to hear your voices. That's why we're having this event. I also want to say that it's impressive about how many people are here. I've worked so closely with Kristen Law, with Co Hernandez, with uh, Lily Thomas, because these are areas that are so intertwined. It's not just one issue, it's a complex issue. I think just, I'll just end with one thing. We can't have equity we can't have accessibility unless we do something about the housing crisis in Marin County. Amen. All right, so we'll, we'll go to one final word from each one of our panelists and then uh, we'll, we'll close out. Ruby. Uh, if, it's, if it's just one final word, like just one word, I'll say thanks. But if it's like <laughs> remarks. Uh, 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 remarks. <laughs> <Okay>. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I just really want to thank you today for opening up to this issue because it's a pertinent issue, it's a challenging issue, and it's an issue that we all face, we all need to understand, and we all need to accept. Thank you. Uh, I, too, am grateful for the substantial number of folks who made time today to be here. It is an important conversation, and it begins inside ourselves. So think about our individual relationship to the privileges that we have. Thank you. Yeah. Jose? Oh, um, I want to thank you all. You've been really awesome crowd and uh, and yeah I enjoyed this really. yeah. Yeah. great below uh, yeah I'd like at the risk of sounding cliche I want to thank you all again too you guys are great uh, <laughs> uh, it's great to you know get the word about, out about the stuff I've been working on and the things that affect me and my friends every day so thank you great <laughs> Julie. Ditto. Thank you very much. <laughs> Keep up the work. All right. Great. So our, our, our panelists will be around. They'll be up in this area. If you want to uh, track them down and, and corner them and uh, ask more questions, feel free to do so. Uh, but thank you all for coming out. <laughs>